everybody and welcome to uh, Oxford University's virtual open day. Uh, we are Magdalen College and this is our Meet the Students Q&A. So we're going to be answering your questions, which you can submit on the uh, live stream Q&A room on Slido. Uh, and uh, we'll answer as many as we can. Uh, my name is Amy. I'm the Outreach and Access Officer at Magdalen College. Uh, and we are joined by four very lovely students. So we'll go around and introduce ourselves. If you guys could say your name, your subject, uh, what your year you're in and uh, maybe where you're from as well. Uh, Erica, can I start with you? Hi, I'm Erica. I'm going into my third year studying chemistry at Magdalen College and I'm from Wakefield in West Yorkshire. Lovely, thank you. Anastasia? Hi, I'm Anastasia. I'm going into my second year studying law with French law at Magdalen College and I'm from Leicester in the East Midlands. Brilliant, thank you. Jonathan? Hi, I'm Jonathan and I'm going into my third year as well and I study ancient and modern history. Brilliant, and Jessica? Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm going into my second year studying biomedical science and I'm from Swindon. Well, thank you all so much. Cool, so we have our first question, uh, which is what are formals like at Magdalen? Uh, so Erica, firstly, could you just explain what a formal is, just in case someone isn't sure? So a formal is a bit like a fancy dinner. Um, you kind of, you all go into hall or anyone who's like booked to go to the formal, I often book to go in a group of friends. So we head into the hall, which is like a big dining room, kind of looks like the one in Harry Potter with like the lights along the ceiling and like big pictures. Um, and you go in wearing like fairly smart attire, but you don't have to be that smart. It's kind of just how you feel comfortable along with a gown, which is like, the best I can describe it is like just a bit of black material that you kind of wear a bit like, but like a like a gilet or something it's it sounds fancy it's not that fancy and you go in and you sit down and you get served kind of starters and then main and then put in uh there are always three courses or at least in my experience always three courses sometimes they come with free wine sometimes they don't and like that's just personal preference as well depending on which ones you book uh and it's really just like a fancy meal that you sit down at and eat with your friends they're not that expensive either. You'd expect them to be quite expensive. At Maudlin, they're between like seven and eight pounds currently, although they do seem to be going up every year. Um, so yeah, it's just a really nice like social thing to do with a group of friends. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. That was very comprehensive. Does anyone have anything to add? Uh, do any of you go to formal much? Or... Yeah, Jonathan. Um, sometimes there are year group or subject specific formals. Um, so if you do come to Magdalen in early October, early on in term, there's like a freshest formal. So um, you get to sit at that with your other people doing your subject and some of your tutors. Um, there's also like a sports formal at some point, which all the sports teams go along to. Um, there's a, Chris, a few Christmas formals. So um, that's like a Christmas dinner, um, but they're basically all the same as what Eric had said. Um, you can wear anything, but you throw on a gown. Um, which I think the best it was described to me is is what Snape wears in Harry Potter. I think. <laughs> he wears a gown through the whole thing. So go Google Snape. Um, yeah. And Brilliant. maybe that will show you what a gown is. That's a good description. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, formals aren't quite as formal as they sound like they might be. They're very optional. You choose to go along. But yeah, there are lots of really fun ones. You can go with friends. <clears throat> Some people like to take families or visiting people because uh, it's quite a sort of Oxford uh, thing to do uh, and yeah lots of sort of uh, really social ones that, as a nice way to have a meal together uh, brilliant okay uh, so we've had a really nice question uh, from Katie thank you uh, which is what is your favorite thing about studying at Magdalen so we can all we can all answer this uh, Anastasia what is your favorite thing about studying at Magdalen um, I quite like the aesthetic behind it I think it's very nice that there's lots of greenery because you know you might be like in a library for several hours a day but then you know to take a break you can go out into Addison's Walk which is like the little footpath around the deer park that we have and that's quite nice just there's a lot of beauty in Morden I think it serves as a nice break sometimes when you you know you're trying to escape reality and you're just surrounded by all these beautiful things around you. Yeah lovely. Uh, Jessica what about you what, what's your favourite thing about studying here? 
I think I'd have to agree. I think it's the grounds. It's really important for me when I'm struggling with an essay or something. I can just go for a walk, clear my head, and it's just all much better when I then go back and sit back down. So I think, yeah, the beautiful grounds and having a deer park to walk around as well is really nice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Erica, what about you? So uh, I was going to say the grounds. That tends to be my answer. But just for a bit of change, I think the people... Um, Maudlin's quite a large college, which means there's like lots of other people, both in your year, in other years, graduate students, undergraduates. And so you kind of get to know everyone's face as well. And you maybe like meet different people all over the place. And so even if you're maybe not necessarily friends with them, you kind of do like a nod and an acknowledge or like a wave as you walk around college. And that just, I don't know, that makes me really happy just that we've got like a little community going and you can just wave at people and say hi. And every time I walk somewhere, I inevitably have to add on like five minutes and set off early because someone will stop me and try and chat to me. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, what about you? What's your favourite thing? So I was also going to say the people that Eric has nicked that. Um, <laughs> but I'll add to the people the fact that most people are on uh, their own college site. Um, which isn't the case in every college it means that it's much easier to see have those interactions and um, with those weird like upward nods that you do um <laughs> that's much more difficult when people are scattered around oxford but because in maudlin uh accommodation is offered for the entirety of your degree a lot of people you can see them quite easily it's not difficult to meet up and do social activities yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So I feel like this sort of leads on to uh, maybe why you guys chose Maudlin as a college or did you choose Maudlin uh, as a college? Um, Jessica, what, what was your reasoning behind choosing Maudlin as a college? I didn't actually choose Maudlin as my college. I applied to university college, but the reasons I love Maudlin are the same as the reasons why I applied to UNIV. I wanted a college that had nice grounds I liked the larger colleges but I feel like it's important to say like even if you apply to a different college most people I've spoken to they fall in love with whatever they end up yeah absolutely so true um Erica I know that the same is true for you do, do you want to talk about that yeah 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 the same sorry uh the same is true for me I didn't apply to Maudlin um I applied to Worcester College mostly because that was my like outreach link college and I'd spent a bit of time there and I'd met a lot of the students there and everyone I met there was lovely and still at the time I hadn't really been around much of Oxford and I still had this kind of view of Oxford like students that maybe they wouldn't be the nicest and yet everyone I met at Worcester was nice so that's kind of my reasoning for applying there along with the fact that I stayed overnight and I had some food in hall and it was 10 out of 10 amazing any anyone who wants to go for food go to Worcester um but like the same thing applies at Maudlin I haven't really met that many people that I wouldn't be happy to sit and chat to everyone's lovely I've not had any like particularly bad run-ins with people and uh the food's all right I'm not gonna lie it's not as good as Worcester's um but, <laughs> We're doing uh, a lot of favors <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't change it at all Maudlin is now my favorite college it feels like home the people I've met here are amazing and I am incredibly glad I didn't end up at Worcester <laughs> yeah no it's such an important thing to say that um no matter where you choose if you get in you will end up thinking your college is the best it's absolutely how it works um for everybody uh for people who did choose Maudlin what was sort of your uh what was your reasoning Anastasia did you choose Maudlin <laughs> yeah I chose Maudlin and got in uh I think obviously the grounds I've mentioned that was one of the reasons why I chose Maudlin and another important thing to me was proximity to the law faculty because Maudlin's quite close to the law faculty it's like a 10 minute walk away at the most so I you know that was quite important to me um and as well I think sticking with the law theme Maudlin's quite well known for law like there are a lot of famous law alumni which kind of appealed to me because I thought you know it's a very strong law college in that sense so I, I quite like that and that that led me to do more research and you know made me more interested in the college so yeah, it was basically about my subject, I guess, which appealed to me. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and Jonathan, what about you? So I, I did apply to Maudlin, of course. 
Um, I think most people tend to apply to colleges for what you might think are quite silly reasons. Um, so a lot of people apply to Christchurch or New College because they're like, oh, I remember a scene from Harry Potter was filmed here or something like that. To be honest, I applied to Magdalen because I came on the open day and the high street was really busy. And Magdalen, I walked into Magdalen, it was quite quiet. And I think the most important thing when choosing a college is that it's going to be the place where you're going to live for the next three years. And I was like, wow, I can kind of imagine living here. It's relatively quiet. My tour guide was quite nice. Um, the JCR was really good. And I knew I'd spend a lot of time. Sorry, that's the junior common room, which is like um, a room with a pool table and darts and a PlayStation. And I knew I'd end up spending a lot of time there. So I was like, I might as well choose somewhere with a good JCR. Um, it just felt quite homely and quite nice. And so that's why I applied. There wasn't much of a, I wouldn't say much detail thought went into it, yeah. but clearly that was a matter because I ended up going to the best college. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, a few things to explain. Um, when you apply to a college, it's essentially like expressing a preference. Uh, and about one third of students end up at a college they didn't apply to because we have a system called pooling. And this basically means that uh, the best candidates in a given year will hopefully get an offer regardless of the college they've applied to. So um, the, the one of the ways we'd recommend you don't get uh, into choosing colleges is sort of based on sort of trying to uh, sort of play the system trying to figure out where you might get in because the polling system basically ensures that um, if we think you are um, good enough to get in you, you you'll get an offer somewhere um, so it's really about choosing somewhere you would like to live uh, and that is a really personal decision uh, uh, it might be uh, about uh, not wanting a long walk to your lectures in the morning, uh, so you want to find out that you're close to your faculty. It might be because you want um, a really nice view. Um, it might be because you want to look specifically about uh, the kind of accommodation. You might want to think about food. Uh, you also might want to think about financial support because uh, there is a, a Oxford University financial support and then there's a uh, additional support from colleges and you might want to look into that a little bit but these are all personal uh, decisions and uh, I would say most students I speak to uh, are made decisions based on things like oh it looked really nice or I got a really nice feeling from it and that is a completely legitimate way to choose um, a college it's about where you're going to live uh, and that's that's very personal for everybody <clears throat> So uh, thank you for your answers, guys. Uh, we've had a question uh, about uh, about the rooms. So how are the rooms? Uh, what are they like? Uh, what's the accommodation like? Um, Jonathan, can I start with you? So this is actually something I didn't mention. Um, on the tour I got of Magdalen, the rooms they took me into were really nice. They were much nicer than um, my room at home. So I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to apply here. Um, <laughs> I think the rooms are more than in general in first year, um, you get put just outside of college. So no more than a five minute walk. Um, there's a place called the Waynefleet building, which is um, I have actually did not live in. So I'll leave someone else to talk about the Waynefleet. Um, and there's more houses around. Um, the rooms in college are all really nice. Um, some of them are en suite. So uh, you have your room and a bathroom. Um, some of them are two room sets, so there aren't as many of them. And even the other ones, um, they're all really nice. Um, they look quite old from the outside, but they're not as old as they look on the inside. Unfortunately, that's a slight facade. Um, but it does mean that you get the awesome look while still having a really nice modern functioning room. Um, you get uh, a fridge, a mini fridge, um, a bed, a sink most of the time. Um, yeah, yeah they're nice rooms fantastic um does anyone else want to add anything on accommodation i think jonathan covered quite a lot yeah Anastasia. i just wanted to mention the wayne fleet building because obviously jonathan mentioned it but didn't live in it so i lived in the wayne fleet building in first year and that's i guess where a majority of freshers live it's you know quite a big building i think 60s style i'd say and it's quite nice because you get a majority of freshers living there so you get to know them a bit more and you know you just you kind of have that inbuilt community already there I lived on the fifth floor which is the highest floor in that building and in there the rooms are fairly big they're quite large actually 
Um, I didn't have a sink in my room, but I did have a really nice view of Magdalen Tower and Magdalen Bridge. And even though it faced the street, it wasn't too loud. Like even if I kept my window open, you know, there was not much sound of the traffic. And I think the most noise I'd get is from um, school children because across the road there was Magdalen College School, which is a um, primary school. So I think that's probably the most noise I got, but that was barely anything. But yeah, the rooms are nice. The thing with the Wayne Fleet building that makes it unique is that it's this particular shade of green, which, you know, might be appealing to some, might not be appealing to others, but it's a nice building. And I live with seven other people. So I had to share a bathroom and a kitchen with seven other people, which, I mean, people think it's a big deal, but it's not, you know, you never really bump into each other because you have different schedules. Like you might cook at 5 p.m. Someone else might cook at 6 p.m. So it's like you never really bother anyone or bump into them unnecessarily. So, yeah like that was never a deal breaker for me sorry you're on mute amy thanks anyone else wanting to add anything cool yeah no and um, that's a really uh, really good way to cover it um definitely something to uh remember which jonathan mentioned is that uh we do uh ensure your accommodation for all uh years of your undergraduate degree uh so you don't have to worry about sort of sorting out private housing uh we have a fixed um uh charge for our um accommodation and it's the same for everybody no matter what room you're in so everyone's paying the same um and <clears throat> generally uh as a rule your rooms will get nicer uh, as the years go on so you'll sort of get really uh, generally get the chance to have a really really quite amazing room at some point uh in your college life um brilliant and the other thing to mention is absolutely we um all students have um access to kitchens which is good right so next question um do you think it's important to choose a college uh, where the tutors specialize in areas of study that you're particularly interested in um so jonathan can you talk about how sort of uh being taught by different tutors works and is this something you think is important to consider so the simple answer is no i don't think so um and that's because in general your teaching is organized by the faculty rather than by your colleges. Um, so, for example, for history, um, it might be that in Magdalen, there's a tutor who specialises in British history in the 17th century. And in Worcester, there's someone who specialises in German history in the 20th century. Um, if I need to have a class on German history, my tutorials, which are my weekly lessons, will be in Worcester and not in Magdalen. Um, and that's not, that's very common. Um, I don't think there's a, well, I won't make a soothing statement, but I really doubt there's many students who don't have lessons in other colleges um, at some point during their degree. And so I wouldn't, I don't think um, seeing that there's a tutor who likes your subject is necessarily a reason to apply to a college, unless of course you want to make some sort of personal connection with them um, and talk to them more about it. But it's not going to impact the quality of your learning or um, what options you can choose. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else have anything they wanted to say on that? Yeah, Erica. So unlike Jonathan, I'm going into my third year and I've never been taught at another college. Um, all of my tutors are located at Magdalen. I think we're very lucky in the fact that Magdalen has tutors that can teach all aspects of chemistry currently. Um, I know other colleges often outsource their teaching. In fact, one of my tutors has um, some people from New College come to him at Magdalen to teach. Um, but I still wouldn't say it's that important um, in terms of teaching. I think what I've found is that in my fourth year, I do a research project. And if, for example, I chose to jump on one of my current tutors' research projects, I would already have that standing kind of connection and knowledge about that tutor um but at the same time they're not they don't favorite their students they won't pick you over another like viable candidate for their research project um so i think the advantage there is very very minimal mm -hmm. yeah i think um i think there is some variation between subjects but i think on the whole um you 
there is always the opportunity to be taught elsewhere, particularly in humanities, you'll certainly be being, um, you know, learning in different colleges. Um, uh, the other thing to say is sometimes it's a bit of a dangerous game to pick a college based on the tutor. You never know that tutor might leave. They might go on sabbatical. They might not be there the year you actually join, which happens um, regularly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you will get the chance to be taught by lots of different academics. Uh, and I would say, again, the college choice is more about the, the living element uh, than, than the studying element. Um, uh, per se. Uh, so, um, Anastasia, I think a question for you. Uh, what is the law library like? It sounds amazing. So, there are two types of law library. So, there's the Oxford one, which is accessible to all Oxford students, regardless if you study law or not. Um, I remember my second term, because I had exams at the end of my second term, I used to go to the law library quite a lot. Um, it's very nice, it's fairly big, and obviously, with COVID regulations and everything, they put measures in place and it's got two floors I think it might have a ground like a basement floor but I've never been there but I've been on the ground floor and then the first floor and it's quite nice especially the first floor you can have like window seats and you know look out um it has all the books you'll ever need I've never actually taken a book out of there but I'm you know I'm sure you can find anything you will need there and then in Magdalen itself we have a law library there which is accessible only to the Magdalen Law students and we have a key to it and it's quite nice you know it's like a nice detached space from the other library and it has all the books you'll need you can't take those out but you can use them in like in the library so sometimes it might be that you might not find the book you'll need on the Oxford online library platform so you can go to the law library and you know find the book there and it, it's a nice area there are two rooms there's like one room with a long table where you know you can have group discussions and you know discuss your subject plan essays and all that and then there's a separate room where you have individual tables and that's like a silent area where you know you can do more individual studies so yeah those are the two law libraries brilliant thank you very much um okay so uh we have a question saying what is an average day and week in your subject like uh so we have a, a bit of a range of subjects here which is good um jessica what what is sort of your average day your average week what does it look like in your subject i think it definitely depends week to week especially with covid where lectures were online um, compared to more towards the end of the year when they started to be scheduled and live streamed and in person again but when it was online I liked to do my lectures in the morning and then spend the afternoon doing the reading doing essay plans so a lot of the work that I have to do for tutorials it is writing essays which I prefer doing in the afternoons rather than in the mornings because it gives me a bit more time to wake up but I think in a week I'd have around 10 to 15 lectures one or two practicals but some were in person some were online again with covid circumstances and i also had for first year we have to do statistics so i had a statistics tutorial each week as well as a problem sheet to do as well brilliant thank you uh sticking with the sciences erica what's what's chemistry like what's it like in a day again varies week to week um and day to day um so generally every morning between nine and eleven uh, sometimes nine and twelve i'll have two or three lectures so that's again 10 to 15 a week in covid times these were recorded online so you could watch them whenever you wanted but before that it was uh, you walked to the lecture theater and watched them live at, with the, the guy right in front of you which seems a bit weird now um on Mondays and Tuesdays, generally, um, I went straight from the lab, uh, the lectures to the labs, and I would spend the remainder of the day plus lunch break in the labs doing whatever that day's lab was. Um, I would have done some prep for this beforehand. Um, a lot of the prep is uh, re going over content, um, doing safety procedures for the lab. So like if we're using anything particularly dangerous or anything, we have to kind of research this and write about the measures we'll take to mitigate it. Um, and just other things like that. And labs tend to finish between five and six at night. So I'd go straight home from there, grab some food. I tended not to work after labs because they kind of just killed me off and I wanted to go to bed. 
Um, sometimes I'd do something social after them, but not usually work. And then Wednesday tended to be a bit more of a relaxed day for me. I would um, do some kind of chill reading or like maybe a little bit of revision or even just seeing friends and kind of doing not much. And then Thursdays and Fridays, between the two days, I would probably have about three tutorials or classes, which is like small group teaching. So it would be like three students to one tutor mostly. Um, where we'd go over the work that I've done for that week. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Anastasia, uh, what about law? What's that like? Um, I think law is very different to sciences because we don't necessarily use lectures to kind of learn from because it's a lot of it is based around reading, you know, your own independent reading. So like a week in my life would consist of you know getting a reading list and reading through it and then getting together with the other lawyers and doing an essay plan and then writing the essay I think normally I'd have about two days to do the reading it's it doesn't sound like a lot but you learn how to prioritize you learn how to you know manage a bulk load of information in a short amount of time and then same with essay writing like sometimes it would take me the whole day but then by the end of first year, I pretty much learned how to do it in a few hours, you know, have an essay plan, have it written and ready for the deadline. And yeah, I think like lectures for me, obviously they're all online as well. And I'd watch them sometimes, but I wouldn't have like a routine of, you know, nine to 11, I have to watch my lectures. It was kind of more when I got to that topic and I needed some extra help with it or like a tutor's input, then, you know, I'd go watch lectures. And classes for us would be, all of the first year law students so there are 11 of us so we have like a two hour two and a half hour class every like once a week and then tutorials would be two students to one tutor so and those would happen once every week and then because we do one and a half subjects so one week you'll have one tutorial the next week you'll have two tutorials and it just it goes like that so yeah brilliant thank you uh, and finally Jonathan what about you Yes, so for history, it's very similar to what Anastasia has just described there for law. Um, so we would have three tutorials every two weeks. Um, so as she says, one, one week, two the next week. Um, and it would be similar for lectures. So I'd have maybe three every two weeks or four every two weeks. Um, in my first year, so before, um, before COVID, they would be on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. Um, but that might vary from year to year. Um, and you go along to examination schools, which is on the high street. I would roll out of bed at about five to nine and still make it to the lecture on time. Um, listen to the lecture there for about an hour and then go back to college. You'd spend some of the day reading. Um, different people spend different amounts of times. So I unfortunately tend to not spend very long. Um, so you spend a few hours of each day reading. Um, lunch you, i tend to meet up with friends um, have lunch together maybe do a bit of reading in the afternoon and then um, do more social things so i have football training or matches most days um and in the evenings i might do um you know a formal or a bop or something social with friends um let's say your tutorials are every tuesday it might be that your deadline was on the monday um and so uh, all of my reading would be uh, done throughout the week so that by Monday afternoon I'd had a plan and was able to finish off the essay. Um, I think first year is quite important in that sense. I'd say the most important part of it is that you figure out how to work um, and how your kind of timetable is going to run. By the In the first few weeks you kind of get a few essays and you're like oh how, how do I have time to do all of this um, but by the end of the year certainly um most people have kind of got to grips with how their week is going to look yeah brilliant thank you fantastic uh so uh just a question i'm going to answer uh what is the proportion mix of international students so the university uh is made up well the undergraduate body is about 23 percent um International students, uh, Magdalen will be so, uh, about around that, but it varies year to year, so there's not sort of a fixed stat. 
Uh, and this person has asked, I'm interested in pursuing history and politics. Are there many students doing this combination? Yes, it's a popular course. It's a popular uh, course choice. Um, I think we take two at Magdalen, I believe, um, but across the whole university uh, per year, we take two at Magdalen. Uh, across the whole university, there's a bit more, obviously. Um, uh, but yeah, it's a very, very popular combination. Uh, okay, uh, so Jonathan, you made me think uh, it might be good to ask you guys about um, what uh, if you guys are involved in any societies, any sports, uh, what do you do other than um, your work? Um, Jonathan, you said you played football, anything else? Yes, so um, I play college football. Um, which is great. That's we have a game every Friday, and there's a um, there's another game on Wednesdays. But I can't make that because I was playing university football, um, which I have a few training sessions every week. Um, I'm also involved in the Christian Union, both in Magdalen and in the wider university. Um, I don't really do much else to be honest, but there's mostly because there's so much on. There's so much available. Um, in Freshers' Week, there's a big fair. And you go and get bombarded with a bunch of flies for everything. Um, so I think I signed up to about 30 different societies, which ranged from like barbershop singing to the one with Nerf, the one with Nerf guns, where um, I'm, I don't really know how it works, but basically you get a target and you, throughout the year, you're kind of following them and then you shoot them with a Nerf gun. Um, there's a whole range of stuff. Um, I'd say there's there's too much to be able to go to, um, but there's so much on offer. It's such a wide range as well. Are any of you involved in any of the slightly quirkier societies? Anyone been along to the Nerf Society? Yeah, have you, Erica? What's it like? I did. I did the Nerf Society. It's called the Assassins Club or the Assassins something. Um, I did that for a while. That was good fun. Um, I went with my friend Dom, and. Yeah, it, it was, Jonathan explained it quite well, but then during COVID, they, it became more of like, they moved it onto Minecraft. Um, and you kind of, you got, you got a target, like username and you had to like find them in the world and then like kill them and then they'd respawn and try and kill you. And it was a whole thing. It's a lot, it was a lot better when it was in person. <laughs> um, you had to be in like a set place at a set time. And then, yeah, you'd have a target and you had to kill them. Um, I've tried I, I went a bit mad in first year I tried a lot of different societies none of them really stuck I think I figured out I prefer to spend my free time with my friends watching Netflix like going out for food maybe just staying in and cooking a nice meal with my friends we used to cook a big roast on Sundays um, just like more chill things rather than like organized um, I'm also on the JCR, which is a little bit like a student council, I always describe it. Um, it's kind of like a group of students who get elected into positions um, and then they can do those positions for a year and like help the student body um, improve college and like push against some of the college staff to maybe get better provisions for students and stuff. Uh, my specific role is in access and admissions. So I do things kind of like this and like talking to schools um, and running the student ambassadors. Uh, being a student ambassador is also really fun. You kind of take schools on tours around Maudlin and uh, talk to them about your experiences and you often get a free lunch out of it. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, is anyone else involved in any um, societies or sports clubs? Yeah, Jessica. So for first year, I decided to join lacrosse and try it out, which was something that I thought was quite interesting. I'd never done it before and it was really beginner friendly and there were limited sessions with everything going on, but it was really fun way to meet some people and uh, get involved and be active. And I also am involved with the Sherrington Society at Magdalen, which is for people interested in medicine and they put on talks by different speakers. And it's just really interesting to get some more information about the subject that I love. Brilliant. Yeah, there is um, absolutely a society for everybody, uh, whatever your interest is. Uh, if that happens not to be, you are welcome to create it as a student here. Uh, and get other people involved. Um, 
And yeah, I think uh, generally lots of people sign up to lots and maybe one or two sticks. Uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can try out all sorts of things. It's one of the many joys of coming to university. It's about um, a lot more than, than just your course, certainly. Um, okay, so someone has asked, oh, uh, I'll just answer, on average, how many students go to Magdalen College for undergraduate study? I think we're around 400 students uh, in total undergraduate um again varies so we're sort of um one of the larger sort of mid-level larger colleges uh, there are some colleges that are a bit bigger than us uh in terms of student size uh, and there are certainly some colleges that are quite a lot smaller as well again that might be something you want to think about in your college choice um you know I know lots of people really want to go to a big college because you think you, yeah you get to meet lots of people and there's lots going on some people prefer the idea of a slightly smaller community uh so yeah that's just something you might want to think about we're sort of somewhere in the middle which is nice uh okay is Oxford uh expensive um Anastasia I'll go to you uh is Oxford expensive um I think well I mean coming from Leicester you know in the Midlands I think it's more expensive than you know it is here in Leicester you know it is the south as I'll consider it so it is slightly pricier but it's not inaccessible and you know there are like say if you're going out you know for a meal or something there are places with different price ranges you know there's a place in the shopping centre called uh, Victor's which is kind of more on the higher end of the price range I mean it's, it's a nice place but you know it's a bit more expensive and then there's also like other food places I can't speak for clubbing or partying because obviously in my first year I didn't really get any of that but like in terms of food places you know there is a large variety and I think one thing that I really liked about first year is that I got some help from the student support fund which is Maudlin's financial um, help that they offer for students and that really helped me kind of be able to enjoy Oxford a little bit more, you know, go out and try different food places um, because Magdalene is a very financially generous college. So, you know, they have all these provisions in place if you need financial help. So, yeah, I think uh, as a whole, like Oxford probably, like, you know, if you're not from the South, Oxford probably will be a little bit more expensive for you, but it's not completely inaccessible. And there's always help out there if, you know, if you do feel like you need it. Yeah. Um, Erica, is there anything you wanted to add, for, to add to that? I mean, I second that, like, coming from the north of England, like, here I would pay maybe, like, I always use pints as a measure of cost. Um, here I'd pay maybe £3 maximum for a pint, whereas, like, in Oxford I've seen pints up to, like, seven, eight quid, which blows my mind. Um, but, the, yeah, like Anastasia said, there is help out there, but also there's ways to live on a budget without having to like stinge. Um, the college bar in the OKB do really cheap drinks. I mean, even their pints are still expensive in my in my mind, but um, I know that you can get like a, a vodka diet Coke is like less than two pounds, I seem to remember. Um, so it's like, it's super cheap to drink there. And there's lots of cheap eatering places. Um, there's a like a, a pad thai place I really like that's like super cheap um and like yeah I also applied to the student support fund and they are very generous um I always tell people so I applied and I asked for 500 pounds just to help me cover like a few little bits or a bit more than a few little bits and they said actually we're going to give you 750 so that you can enjoy yourself a little bit more which I think just shows like how generous they can be and that it's not just a fact of they'll give you the bare minimum they will they really do care about you and they do want to help yeah absolutely Jonathan um I think there's also uh good to realize that aside from Oxford as a city um the a lot of the costs which you might have in other places as a student you wouldn't necessarily have in Oxford so for example um you won't you won't have to buy many books um, as an Oxford student because they are all available in multiple libraries across the city. So Morden's Library, for example, is very extensive. Um, the Bodleian has every book that was ever written um, is in the Bodleian. Um, and so other costs which you might have um, 
as a student, if you were in a different university, you might not have as Ox at Oxford. So although some things might be more expensive, um, you also save in other areas. Um, for example, Magdalen has a good travel grant. Um, so um, I'm doing my thesis this year. So if I wanted to go um, to a different city to look for artifacts and sources, more than will reimburse me for that. Um, so I, I think it's probably true that the city is slightly more expensive than um, certainly um, other cities in the UK. Um, but there are other expenses as a student which are cheaper than elsewhere. Also, um, if you are paying for accommodation, um, uh, college, because you're in college and accommodation, it's much cheaper um, in Maudlin, for example, than it would be if you were in a house which you're renting privately. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're really, really good points. Um, I think undeniably Oxford uh, is a more expensive city, well, depending on where you're coming from. If you're coming from London, it might be a little bit, a little bit cheaper. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a fairly expensive city, but living in a college uh, is really uh, saves you a lot of money. College subsidises an awful lot of things, uh, food, drinks, activities. Uh, then we have specific financial support available, uh, which uh, you can access. <clears throat> accommodation as well as just being um, quite reasonably priced uh, because it's you're, you're only paying for the time you're actually in it so that's eight week terms uh, rather than paying for the entire year like you would if you were privately renting at another university uh, so yeah I think uh, exactly as Jonathan said the sort of extra costs of the city are cancelled out by actually um, uh, the things that, that the university offers um, like free gym membership at Maudlin as well. So like all sorts of things like that, um, that, that really save you, save you costs uh, in lots of ways. Um, it's worth mentioning, um, lots of people often ask about uh, part-time jobs. Uh, so at Oxford, you can't uh, particularly get a part, you can't get a part-time job during term time uh, because the work we have shorter terms than other universities uh, and quite a high workload. So the idea is actually that your your workload will probably be equivalent to a full-time job in terms of um, time, and it would be um, uh, unfair to expect people to be having to work uh, to earn money around that. Uh, but that is not intended to be a barrier. If you are worried about affording your term without a part-time job. You are absolutely able to go to the college and say you might need some extra financial support and they uh, will provide it to you. They don't want um, finances to be a barrier for anybody coming to study with us. You can get um, jobs um, uh, through the university, sort of uh, small work. So this lot um, are being paid for this, for example, um, uh, things like that as well. And lots of people return to jobs uh, in the long breaks because we get very long, a long time off at Easter, a long time off at Christmas and three months off over the summer. So lots of people go home to uh, part-time work there so that's just something to mention uh, we it's really not something to worry about uh, okay um, is there a high proportion of students taking a particular subject in the college or would you say it's quite mixed this will vary college to college um, some departments are bigger than other departments at, at, at Magdalen and you can look up sort of exact uh, numbers um, off the top of my head his, history is quite a big subject at Magdalen um, as is English uh, there are a couple of sort of larger subjects um, and, and some uh, smaller subjects but it's very mixed uh, as in you know it's not like the historians all sit on one table and uh, you, you're on your own if you're if you're studying fine art or something you know it's uh, <clears throat> and you you'll interact lots with other students at other colleges doing your subject uh, as well um okay uh what are tutorials like good question um Jessica how, how do you find tutorials what are they like I think tutorials can differ depending on which tutor you have. So some of my tutors do things slightly differently. But for most of my tutorials, I have an essay that I have to write and send in beforehand. And then I'll either get feedback before the tutorial or during the tutorial and we'll go over the topic and it will just give a better understanding. There's three of us that do biomed at Magdalen in my year. So it's the three of us in a tutorial with the tutor. And sometimes we're asked to bring a diagram along with us. And it can seem quite scary at first to have to like explain a diagram to your peers and the tutor, but it's actually a really good way of getting a better understanding of the topic and actually knowing the topic and what you're going on about. It's actually a really good way 
by explaining it to other people. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Anastasia, what, what, about, uh, what about for law? What are your tutorials like? Um, so definitely, as Jessica said, it kind of varies from tutor to tutor and what style they choose to have. For me, I think the two most prominent styles that I've experienced is like one type of tutorial might be where, you know, you'd go in and the tutor might ask you based on this week's reading, what do you think about a certain case or what do you think about a certain article? And then you just kind of have like a back and forth debate. You know, they play devil's advocate or your tutorial partner would play devil's advocate. And you just kind of have like this big discussion about that week's reading. And then the other type of tutorial I've had is like a Q&A kind of style. So the tutor might ask you, you know, what are you, what did you find difficult this week? What do you have any questions for me? And then you'd ask them questions and then explain and then you'd have a discussion about it. So it, like it's kind of more in a Q&A format rather than a debate. And in most tutorials, we talk about that week's work. So like, you know, if we'd written an essay for that tutorial, sometimes, you know, you have the opportunity to ask about it and you know, sometimes tutors might be a bit late on their marking. So you might, you know, ask them in advance, like, oh, was my essay all right? Was, you know, is there anything I need to change? So you might be able to discuss that. And then your tutors would give you advice on the spot. Sometimes they'd give you your essay afterwards. It really depends. But yeah, I think those are the two main styles, like the debate type of style and then the Q&A type of style for law. Mm, um, Jonathan, what about uh, in history? So... In history, I think in general, the tutorials are quite similar in that they're more discussion based. Um, I've definitely found that tutorials are the most interesting part of my Oxford experience so far. Um, so you will have spent a week um, reading about a particular topic and um, you've probably written an essay on it um, and you will have probably submitted your essay the day before the tutorial. Tutors like it differently. Um, and then you have a discussion around that topic. Um, and often you get to see a slightly different perspective on that topic than the one you might have pursued in your essay. Um, tutorials are very small uh, group classes. So me personally, the largest number I've had in a tutorial is four students to one tutor. Um, and I've only had that once. Um, so they're small group discussions. They can sound slightly intimidating, but they are... They are discussions. Um, they're trying to, if everyone in the room is learning off each other, trying to figure out um, what our particular view is on this topic or that topic. Um, you might actually get a small taster of what a tutorial would look like at interview. Um, if you do that stage of the application process, it's a similar type of thing. Um, you might be looking at a source, you might be looking at a particular question, um, you might be looking at a particular event. Um, but in general, they're just discussions about a particular topic. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, and Erica, and anything other to say on tutorials? Um, my tutorials are a little bit different in that it's less discussion based um, and more kind of problem solving on a whiteboard. Um, kind of, we'll do a problem sheet, which is just like a sheet of questions and like, why does this happen? show what happens with this or maybe a bit of maths and then uh, the tutor will say okay for question one Erica you're going to get up on the whiteboard and explain how you did it um, if you didn't do question one very well you could you then say oh I'm not quite sure about that can someone else do it and then someone else would do it and if there's a question that everyone's stuck on the tutor will then get up and explain it to us and we'll spend a little bit more time on that topic um, and if there's one that everyone's comfortable with and everyone understood, then we'll spend less time on it. And it's more trying to like find holes in our understanding of um, reactions and mechanisms and uh, just making sure that the topic we're covering that week is fully understood. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so someone has asked if we have any tips uh, for a personal statement. Um, what do we think about personal statements? If people just had uh, one tip, um, Jessica, what do you have a tip for a personal statement? I think it's important to be yourself. Don't try and put across someone that you're not. The whole point of a personal statement is to show your interest for your subject and get that across. So I wouldn't try and be the person that you think universities are looking for because they're not looking for any particular 
type of person. So just be yourself would be my tip. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Erica? I think my top tip would be rather than say you've read a book, rather than just describing what happened in that book, because chances are the tutors have probably read it or seen it or heard of it, of it, rather than just describing what happened, like thinking critically on it. And I do think this applies for both humanities and science and probably most subjects. If there's anything you've done, whether it's you've watched a documentary or a podcast or read a book, um, demonstrate your understanding by commenting on it critically. Brilliant. Yeah, both really excellent pieces of advice. Um, Anastasia, any, any other pieces of wisdom? Uh, just to bounce off of Erica, I think don't be afraid of mentioning, like say if you have any niche interests within that subject, don't be afraid of mentioning that. So I don't know, for law, say if you have an interest in the death penalty or something like that, or, you know, just something kind of really small and particular or very interesting. Don't be afraid to mention that because that just shows off who you are as well as a really in-depth interest in that subject so you know if you've read a really interesting book on a tiny tiny topic you know mention it and talk about it and analyze it because I think tutors like to see that because for law you know you have the big general books that everyone reads like the secret barrister you know stuff like that which every single student will mention whereas if you have something that's a bit more out there you know if that's your interest then don't be afraid to mention it brilliant thank you and Jonathan I don't have any groundbreaking tips for this, to be honest, but uh, don't lie on your personal statement um, is probably one which I think more people fall into than you think. If you say you've read a book, um, and do you actually have read it or at least have read part of it um, because it is possible that you'll be asked about an interview and you'll come across looking a little silly if you've mentioned a book for a paragraph and actually you just copied what Jason said about it and don't really know much about the book. Um, yeah, uh, no, I think that's very good advice. And I think that links to what Jessica said in that if you don't want to read it, don't mention it. <laughs> uh, you know, only mention things that you're wanting to read. Um, yeah, my tip would be um, depth rather than breadth. It's easy to think that you need to absolutely wow us with an endless list of uh, things you've read and done and places you've been uh, and we'd rather you you picked a few things you're really interested in and sort of really talked about them in detail uh, critically um, and, and showed us um, some of those skills uh, uh, that's what we would say uh, I think um, okay so um, there aren't any more questions in the Slido but I usually like to finish um, on a sort of general top tip so people attending this open day, you guys might be year 13s who are on the brink of applying, you might be year 12s, um, you might be a bit younger, sort of looking ahead, um, you might be uh, abroad. Um, what is your guys' advice to people attending this open day in relation to applying to Oxford um, or applying to Magdalen? Erica, can I start with you? I think my top tip would be to use all the resources you have available to you. Um, don't think, oh, I can just go it on my own. Oh, I know everything. Um, it's very tempting to do that. Um, use, if you have a teacher who knows about the process, talk to your teachers, um, the teacher of the subject you want to apply for, um, talk to them and really make sure that it is a subject you want to be studying for three or four years. Um, there's lots of resources online. Um, I know there's some on the Maudlin website. There's um, uh, just lots of resources out there. And I'm sure your teachers can find some, you can find some. Um, just really making the most of this opportunity and seeing it more of a learning experience rather than necessarily a, oh my God, I have to get in because whatever university you end up at, you will have fun and you will learn a lot. So treat this as a, oh, let's see what happens. Let's see what I learn. Let's see if I can have any fun with this. Yeah, brilliant. That's excellent advice. Thank you. Uh, Jessica, what about you? What's your top tip? 
I think my tip would be if you're coming to an open day and you're unsure about whether or not to apply, take it as the opportunity to get to know a bit more about the university and the subject that you want to study. And if you're unsure about whether to apply because you're worried about getting in, you're not going to get in if you don't apply. So it's worth a shot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Anastasia. I think my top tip would be about general welfare, you know, look after yourself. And I know this can be a very tricky and tough process and it might seem hard and like you have to do a million and one things to look impressive and, you know, all that. But genuinely just look after yourself. Don't burn yourself out because that's just the worst thing that could happen. You know, don't forget to sleep. I think many people sacrifice sleep for doing other things and it's just not necessary. And I think that not only happens right now in year 12 or 13 or whatever stage you are in life it happens at uni it happens in your job you know sometimes you just forget to look after yourself and put yourself first so I think that would be my main top tip because if you put yourself first you avoid the risk of burning out and then you can be even more efficient and productive and whatever you want to achieve so yeah brilliant thank you and Jonathan it's always hard being the last top tip. <laughs> yeah, especially when the one before you was like life life lessons for them. <laughs> um, first of all, if you're in year 12 or 11 and you're already coming to the open day, huge kudos to you. You're much more organised than I ever was as a student. Um, I think my top tip would be um, that in general, there are quite a lot of people I think who don't apply because they think, um, Oxford isn't for people like me um, and it's only when you arrive that you figure out actually there's a huge wide range of people here um, and so don't let stereotypes or individuals that you've heard of who are at Oxford put you off um, there is as many people um, as there are in the world um, different experiences you'll find a lot of those people at Oxford um, and so don't feel that this is a place which isn't for you so you're not going to apply um you might apply and might not get in at least you tried um but if you do apply and you get in um i think you'll have a great time here you'll have a great experience and um you'll look back on it fondly yeah absolutely fantastic tips guys um yeah i, I can't really say anything better than that you've got five university choices if you're doing it through UCAS. um absolutely make us one of them we'd love that um, it's a great process. It's really interesting. Um, it stretches you. We love your subject. Um, uh, and yeah, as Erica said, there are tons of free resources out there for you to access. Um, so please do have a look. Magdalen College's website also has a chat to students function where you can drop them a message if you'd like to know a bit more uh, about being a student at Magdalen College. Uh, we also have a Q&A with our tutors at uh, two o'clock so if you'd like to come to that you can meet some of our very very lovely tutors and ask them your questions then as well so thank you so much for joining us massive thank you to our ambassadors you've been absolutely excellent uh, and yeah thank you for joining i hope you enjoy the rest of the open day thank you very much <laughs>